Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. Hey everyone, I'm here with Vadim. Vadim is a post-exit founder. He sold this business, I want to say... Like, like back in 2014. 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's been, been a while. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. So I've been doing a bunch of other stuff since then. Yeah. So it's been 10 years. Tell yeah. us a little bit about some of the stuff that you've been up to since you sold your oh, company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, so when I sold to my company, I, I was actively involved in, at, in the tech industry, in the, in the, in the advertising. So I've been running kind of, uh, so basically the company that I sold, it was a spin-off that originally was, was, was created under the umbrella of my uh, first company. So tell me about this company that you spun it off from a previous company that you had. So I started the company that was running uh, in-game advertising in, uh, in the social media apps okay. on Facebook and a few mostly Russian-speaking uh, social ne uh, social media networks like Vkontakte, Mail.ru, etc. At, at the time, it was very like I mean they had a very large audience. They were much bigger than than Facebook. They opened up their app platform. I remember this being special because Facebook was moving in country by country, yeah. and they weren't able to succeed in Russia. Yes, b because in Russia they 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 created vvk.com and they basically the front end worked much faster than than facebook so yeah they took the okay yeah that's true they took the concept from mark zuckerberg i mean they really they copied a lot of stuff but they made it better that's for sure i think this is interesting because whenever you hear about facebook and how they grew right they went country by country and they they squashed everybody yeah but these guys they were so but in quick. russia they could be because they were so quick. they launched exactly at the very right time because i think facebook launched like what 2005 or something or 2004 and i think vk launched when i was uh i think maybe like um freshman in university or, so, or something it was like 20 or seven or 26 okay and uh so like very right time maybe two years later than facebook basically when facebook was already when they expanded beyond the campuses yeah vk already i think the the, the guys i mean the founder of vk already started to work on that so it was a big deal it was a yeah. very large audience there and uh they uh, and they because they started to open they decided basically to create a app a marketplace and then they opened it up so for for third party advertising, it was a very big deal because you could just basically sell. You could create like an, a monetization solution for these app developers because they didn't have any monetization ways. Where were you when this was happening? So How at that time, I was yeah, I was I went in you know that's Ukraine, my hometown, and but I was already. So I mean, since I was eighteen, I was trying to, a different businesses. And uh, I was doing, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, e-commerce store, uh, game development company, web development studio, uh, uh, a social media marketing agency, like lots of lots of lots of stuff. Uh, stuff, and it was more. I treated it more like, more like a game, more like a hobby. At, at the same time, I was trying. I, I was still trying to not get kicked out from university and a big what you're in school while you're yeah in... i was like so my degree was business okay. and management and uh, i was basically doing like barely a minimum just to not be kicked out because i was working on my other stuff and education that familiar and education was not a priority for me <laughs> at all right it's it, hard to be focused on the class when you're actually building a business and yeah. you're like this is so much more interesting and it's actually generating of money of course and, and i was have... like and i was kind of technically studying for business and management but uh in fact i was getting all my knowledge working on all my stuff right and yeah. I, I truly believe that entrepreneurship cannot be taught but it can be learned right so that's why i realized that in business management you cannot really kind of be taught to 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 know this you can just you learn you can learn it by 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 actually running your companies making your own mistakes so basically and then so my so 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 that company uh it was my first and a real company yeah it was bootstrapped so i started like really in the uh, to run ads on this vk.com i was maybe the first one of the first monetization providers for app developers on vk.com and then we started to expand into a mail.ru it's another it was already a, a, a rival of a vk in eastern europe and then we expanded into 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 facebook and at that time vk opened its ads api for any small and medium-sized businesses yeah so, so you know like on facebook there is this targeted advertising so vk opened their own targeted ads platform and they opened up their ads a api so we built inside my company it, it was called clicky we built a special uh, we, we, we built a prototype of a solution that was technically a dashboard on top of your advertising panel so if you're an smb uh, running ads through vk.com okay my the, the, that uh, uh, like that product that we built it helps you 
to make it more to, to run the campaigns more effectively to have more reporting to add conversion tracking like uh, all, all kinds of stuff right that you're was creating not that feedback loop yeah so th that was not available at the time so basically we made advertising account on vk much more powerful and robust on how, top of using ads API. How are you able to move so quickly? Is it because you had this development agency? I mean, yeah. That I, you were able to yeah, put developers I had on a, it? Quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a friendly team of developers who are still, they were not on the payroll, uh, but I've been getting, giving them some projects all the time, like my experiments. And they were kind of, they were always available for me. And that's why I, I was able to move fast. Yeah. So, and basically, yeah. So I created that prototype inside my company Clicky because that was something different. It was not anything related to serving ads on the apps. It was basically a SaaS tool. Right. Right. It was a SaaS tool and like for SMBs. And it went, I mean, it went pretty, I mean, I, I think it went okay in, uh, Russian speaking region in Eastern Europe, but I couldn't scale it further because my my my, my goal was to scale it uh, over overseas to scale it in the US market. Yeah, and I did, I liked when I didn't have enough experience. I did, I only knew that the only game I like I only knew about bootstrapping. I not not even knew. I didn't know that there were any other ways to run business besides bootstrapping. And I think I did I I didn't move as fast, not even as fast. But what is what is interesting that. I had a few competitors and they all died because that market in initially, I mean, uh, like eventually that market actually ceased to e exist. I mean, it's like any companies that helped advertisers to run ads on top of vk.com, et cetera, they ceased to exist because that market in, in, in Russian speaking re region is very corrupt in terms of if you want to, because we also wanted to help, to help the agencies to run ads effectively, but agencies only cared about what was called super commission, that if you give them a kickback on, oh, the, on, on their budget. And they said, guys, really, come on, we don't, we don't, care, we don't care about your software. If you're going to give us a kickback, we're going to run, uh, we're going to run ads. Do we say kickback or do we say like affiliate model? Well, there it was <laughs> mostly a kickback because it was mostly in a gray zone because the kickback was usually money paid not to the business, but to the manager or oh. the decision maker privately that that was that and I, I didn't understand that at the beginning then I understood it and that's yeah. why all those businesses all those entrepreneurs who wanted to jump into this and run a, and build a SaaS business to help new advertising uh, tool uh, to expand it actually and help them and basically to build upon it they all ceased to exist because uh, the, their business model di didn't work because they the value that they wanted to provide was not was not re, was not re, a real value for those people. Mm. Those people, though, uh, the, the agency guys, they, they they only wanted to make money r right now, and ideally to get to to get them into their pockets. That's tricky for American businesses and in business school. Yeah. One of the scenarios is um, you have this company and you're working in these different countries, yeah. and different countries have different uh, <clears throat> different guidelines as far as yeah. like bribery charges or, or kickbacks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little hard, tricky for American companies or, or working in different countries where you have different standards. Yeah. And how do you compete in those countries? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of an interesting kind of like international business uh, theme, yeah. right? Is that what you can do in one country is not standard practice in another country. Whenever I hear about your business, there's some things that are really interesting. There's like in-app ads are a hundred millions of plus businesses. There's a yeah. lot of businesses that exploded overnight. Of course. So that's a pro, right? Yeah. Uh, cons is that you're dependent on platform. Of course. Right. And like the platform has a weird relationship with you where they want you and they don't want you. Right. Yeah. It, you, you depend that? on a single platform and o o also when you build your ad serving engine or something like that, yeah. technically your IP, it doesn't matter. Everyone can copy this very quickly because technically what you develop is not very complex. So the threshold to enter your market is very, uh, is very symbolic, right? One of the advantages that you had is that you had your development team and you were able to move very quickly. Yeah. But one of your barriers is that, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that whenever you're looking at moving to the United States, it requires more capital connections and yeah. it's a little bit of a, it's a jump. Yeah. yeah. So I had my development team, I was very hungry. In terms of, I didn't uh, accept uh, and and know as as an answer, and I yeah. I was very persistent and was very agile, very quick. But 
I lacked experience in, in terms of building a really global business. I didn't know about any other ways to build a global a business, like how to get enough capital, enough re uh, resources to, to be basically accelerate my learning curve and to accelerate my like the growth of my company. I only knew about, I thought the only way to do that was bootstrapping. And, I, and I've been actually thinking that, that way all the way until I, so, so I saw that that business that was called Ad Center that was spun off from my first company after I realized that I have to raise money to it because that business was burning cash. Was because, it burning cash on the uh, development or marketing? Or? Uh, we were making only like, let's say, a small commission on top of the advertising budget, right? The, okay. uh, the, the business model was that you get you know, a, few, a few percent commission on the, on the ad budget. But in order to get big budgets, I have to give away, I have to give kickbacks to all these agencies. I had to basically go and then wine and dine them. I had to go to <laughs> sauna with them, whatever. Like yeah. I had to be yeah, Banya. Yeah, <laughs> Banya. I have yeah, to give them Arctic. expensive presents. <laughs> and that was just my, my game. I despised that. That's why I actually that's wanted, game. that's what I all the time I wanted to, as soon as I realized that I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I wanted to move to the United States because for me, I mean, Ukraine is a great country, but in terms of inter entrepreneurship, it's, it's not a great country at all because entrepreneurship was not very respected there. And because in order to be an entrepreneur there, you had to be kind of uh, a part of gray economy if you really wanted to make money there. And it was not, it was very, it was against my values, against my uh, pr uh, uh, principles. So basically I had to sell the business just because it, otherwise I would shut it down later uh, because yeah. I couldn't attract enough advertising budgets to make enough commission to make it really scale and also that I also could re reinvest some capital back into the company to grow and expand into different markets. Hey, podcast listeners. Whenever I was first scaling my business, Support Ninja, I was trying to figure out if there was an operating system or a framework that would help me figure out how do I structure these departments? How do I get the right people in the right seats? How do I navigate building my uh, standard operating procedures? And it was at that point that I came across Traction by Gino Wickman and the EOS framework. Um, highly recommend it. If you guys are looking for an operating system to run your business, check out EOS Worldwide. And we also made this entrepreneurship network called Founder Org. That's a great way to connect with other entrepreneurs that are also figuring out how to run and scale their business. If you guys are interested in either, check out eosworldwide.com and founderorg.com. All right, back to the pod. So help me a little bit with numbers here. Yeah. This is 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm thinking 2013, yeah, yeah. 2014. So I sold it in 2014 and I launched it in 2012. I mean, it was like, a, like two years. In, so that's a pretty tight yeah. period, right? Yeah. From, from start to end. How many employees did you have working on the, on the business? How much uh, ad revenue was flowing through? What was your margin on it? Well, I mean, I think at that time in total, so it was like, it, technically it was sitting, I mean, I had the same office, right? And yeah. there was like people working at Clicky, doing like working on this, uh, basically ad network, we can call it an ad network. And at the same time, we, we there was a small team building this SaaS um, uh, tools. Uh, maybe on SaaS part, I had like maybe up to 20 people, not more than that. And, and, and 20 people more, or maybe 30 people more were building an ad network. So in total, I think my team was like 50 people a maximum, but only 20 of, of those were focused on, uh, on uh, developing like this uh, SaaS tool. And we were getting yeah. the commission from one to 5%, I think 5% for direct clients, 1% for agencies, maybe 2% okay. on agencies. I mean, that's pretty common. We didn't charge any subscription revenue yet. And I think at that time, Businesses, business owners wouldn't even understand that. They would like and say, "Why? What? what, what, what like, what is the sense for me to pay this?" Because the market was so uh, like, so unprepared for that. Yet it was like, especially like ten they years didn't know ago, it was normal. In, right? Um, in the in the Eastern Europe, it was uh, maybe like in the in the U.S. Like I don't know, the beginning of uh, like two thousand, uh, maybe two thousand one or two thousand two, right? Like first years of SaaS economy. So it was like the first years of SaaS economy in the in the Eastern Europe, right? So 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 that's why. I couldn't even charge them a uh, subscription fee. I mean, I don't remember the budget actually, but I remember I mean, because it was a long time ago. But what I remember is that a few times we were we, we were near break even, right? Yeah. A few times, but then 
one of the advertisers or, or an agency would kind of, because yes, this, this the switching cost was so low. That was one of the problems of ad tech business. That switching cost was was so low because they could just yeah. be, be, and they could just switch there to another third party provider very quickly, promptly, right? And at that time, so 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 our revenue was fluctuating a lot. The churn was sometimes high, and so we were not able to build projections for, uh, for for i mean for uh, for a long term and eventually i just decided to to get in touch with a few people i thought would understand it and would thought would need it i knew those people al already and one of them was uh, actually my friend i mean he was running a company in the us but he was originally from 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 ukraine the company is called uh, ad intelligent and they do so it, it was called Verta Media, now it's called ad intelligent and they were doing that I mean, ad network. Uh, then they went into RTB, real time bidding, etc. And they right. needed that center to get into social, to get into social ads. So that's why uh, they they got it. And uh, I mean, it was not a big, big exit, but I get my first kind of liquidity, and then I started to invest actively into my kind of main company, like uh, uh, called your Clip. parent company. Yeah, yeah, like and I also started to invest in, in startups. I launched the, one of the first startup accelerators in Ukraine. Like I started to do different things. And what was the sale price for the company? I mean, it, it, it was like, uh, like, uh, like seven figures, like, but they were you, it was not big, yeah. Okay, but it's enough that you're able to to do this incubator and yeah, 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 parent yeah, yeah, company, yeah, yeah, and yeah. also just having liquidity is, yeah, yeah, is yeah, a pretty yeah. big deal. Yeah, so I was like 20, uh, 25 for me. Like, that's pretty good for yeah. like at twenty five. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and so you had was it the biggest incubator in in Ukraine? I at mean, the time? we. It was the first one, maybe not, I mean, we incubated 20, 12 companies, okay. uh, invest our, our own money with uh, one, my, my two friends. And uh, at that time, two others launched. One of them was backed by one of the richest oligarchs in Ukraine, yeah. uh, And uh, But I think they incubated pretty much the same, maybe uh, the same number of companies, maybe slightly bigger, but not like 100 companies, right? Okay. And another one was backed by another oligarch. So like in, it was like two oligarch backed incubators. <laughs> and, and, and you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I did think you shake their hands and you're like, hello, Pierre. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they had <laughs> their intermediaries. They had, the, they, they, I mean, they, they had your people talk to their that. people. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, I mean, and that, that model just didn't work for any for anyone on that market because, and since then, we don't have any acceler real accelerators in, in okay. Ukraine because at that time, founders were uh, ready to just, uh, you know, like, they were not ambitious enough. They didn't want to move because this can only work if they move to the more developed market, if they move to the US, etc. But they wanted to build. Very, they, they, they were not very ambitious. They wanted to basically build lifestyle businesses, but they pretended that they wanted to build startups in order to get some cash. And it just, I mean, and, and it was probably we did some mistakes because my first mistakes in investing were that I picked great ideas, but I underestimated the that uh whether the teams were ready to grind and endure for five ten years a lot of times whenever i see great ideas i'm like this is fantastic but it might be something new right and like if it's something new then you have to educate the market on what that new thing is yeah and it's not proven like if yeah. i know what your playbook is for yeah. building an ad market i know it's possible i know what the margins are i know there's some knowns, right? Yeah. And so you're risking not just on their ability to work, but also the idea. Yeah. And whether there's room for the idea. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, so ideas that we invested in are still great. What were the ideas? If you I mean, one of the ideas remember. was, uh, I mean, yeah, some of them were opportunistic that there was a device that you wear when you sleep and it produces some electromagnetic uh, waves that help you to uh, that increase your chance to have a real dream. I mean, interactive dream. It's I've heard about like act, dream. active dreaming, conscious dreaming. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it was called uh, Lucidink, like Lucid, whatever. Like. Did it work? I mean, Did it it? it worked for some people. I tried it. I think it didn't work for me, but it worked for my partners. I think. I mean, so it worked for some people. It didn't work for some for some people. Is it like but, a fancy hat you wear? It's like a hat. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like a hat, but it was not fancy at the time. It was really clunky, but I think well, <laughs> it worked for some people. But uh, and then they actually one of the founders moved to the U.S. But I think I still don't understand. I think I think because fifty percent of people didn't feel fifty percent of people f felt it, and, uh, and they, so they did. Okay, they needed just more capital, much more capital to sustain until they get all their 
I, until they get some universities behind them, some researchers behind them. They need to invest much more. But that's the whole thing money. around like the education piece, yeah. right? Because a lot of people don't know what active dreaming is, yeah. like for one thing. Yeah. And then like a lot of people don't, may or may not have this experience. Yeah. And there's like, um, did you read that article in the Wall Street Journal? I was talking uh, three years ago. Not everyone has that monologue that kind of runs through their head. Oh, right, yeah. Um, and not everyone has the ability to like imagine pictures or imagine okay. like not everyone's a visual thinker and there's certain populations that think or function different ways. And so I think it's interesting that with this group, you're like trying to find these like people that have the ability to act a dream. But what is that worth to that person? Like if I could act a dream, that's worth a lot to me. I can do some really cool stuff of in my course. dreams. Yeah, like yeah. it'll be great. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that don't know about it. Exactly. They had to invest in education. They, they didn't have a lot of demand ready yeah. to basically uh, just uh, to get this thing for whatever price. And that's why they just didn't have enough capital to s sustain until they get there, until they get to basically, I don't know, from nice to have to the painkiller or, or something, right? And there were, uh, uh, like, and we had some some other th things that just were in the same pattern, great ideas, but just uh, yeah. founders were not ambitious enough or didn't move to the US or just were not great presenters or just great because i mean there are like mm, they were like great ideas but not strong founders or like for example like great ideas but founders were not ready to pitch right okay and when they're not re re ready to pitch now i understand that it's uh it can have very negative consequences because they will they likely won't be able to secure enough capital you you've invested in 50 companies now which ones have made it I mean, yeah, so at that time we invested in 12, then I invested personally as an angel, probably, I don't know, maybe I don't know, seven, eight, and then I got, uh, and then I launched a VC with my business partner, Iher, and we invested in 45, yeah, so in total maybe it's like around 60, but as on behalf of VC, we invested in 45 since the end of 2021, uh, so like, yeah, so in my angel portfolio, I have a few companies that uh, 5x return, like, uh, then, uh, but I expect my, a much bigger return one another uh, half of my shares right right and i have a few post series a maybe almost series b companies in my personal per, uh, uh, portfolio and in my vc portfolio i already have a few series a companies that might be very big wins but yeah we, we need to wait for longer time let's talk about the company that you've been running for the past seven years yeah, yeah so like eight years since since inception of the idea since i started financing it but seven years since i joined as a ceo Right, because at first it was just an experiment for me. I, I was still running my previous company, right? That right. I was telling you about Clicky, but then at the same time, I, I decided that uh, I got, I just at some point of time, I got fed up with advertising, with ad tech, with anything to have having to deal with all, all, all this kind of scam, chargebacks, people surrounding me who wanted basically just to steal uh, money from me. I mean, I mean, like people in the industry, the ad tech industry was very and dirty at that time. It was like twenty. 16, 2015, especially if we're talking about uh, mobile installs, people promoting apps, right? There's a, okay. a, a, a lot of fraud there, a lot of scam, and uh, a, a lot of artificial installs. Probably you've seen these images with the uh, iPhone farms in China where you have thousands of iPhones. Oh my gosh, so you're yeah. dealing with like SM. M panels, right? Is that the right? No, 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 no. no. It's like it's like uh, some people were invested in thousands of iPhones, uh, right? And they're all lined up. They were and they're doing what all time? the time, all the time, running. Uh, How running do you apps counter and Installing that? apps, installing apps. How do you counter? Well, that? I mean, it's always kind of it's basically like it's never ending game. Like you catch they, up, you catch up, and then they go ahead, and then okay. you, you catch up, and they were trying, and they basically, of course, they. The, the, these companies were trying to send me some traffic, some in installs, pretending that they are real. Right. And then my advertisers refused to pay for some installs because they, they blamed us. And we were constantly in between. That makes sense. You know, this fi uh, fire. Like, uh, so, Vadim, you're, you're like in the middle of this. Yeah, yeah. And so you have like these, um, these, these apps that are trying to get promotion. You're facilitating the ad buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have these, these places right. in the Pakistan and sources. India yeah, yeah, yeah. that have uh, thousands of yeah. phones that are, are one installs. And so there's companies yeah. that yeah. these people are going to to say, I want to buy a thousand installs or a yeah. hundred thousand. Yeah, in uh, certain watch. geographies, certain targeting criteria, et cetera. And a lot of, we had thousands of publishers who were uh, legit. They were app developers, yeah. uh, some websites. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But 
uh, some of them were not legit, and they were pretending that they are legit. And it's an Iranian story because, because obviously that space attracted a lot of scammers because they could make a lot of money overnight, right? And that's why we always had to uh, fight with them, but uh, still they would catch up, etc., etc. And that's why at some point of time I realized, well, the company was making, uh, actually, the company was doing really well, but I was like, well, I'm not... I'm just, I stop to be really excited every day because I'm like, the money is not the answer because I just, I, I started to feel it well. I actually wanted to work on some great things and some, I don't know, like in, in, innovative things and like bringing v value and not trying to just basically catch bad actors and deal with all these right. litigations, fraud, etc. I'm like, no, I want to do something else. I could see myself. Yeah. <laughs> I could see that itch. <laughs> so what, what was the next um, thing that we were able to capture that excitement? and, and Yes, and about? then it was like 2016, it was the beginning of the rise of uh, augmented reality computer vision hype. It, that that right. was the first wave at that time. At, at that time, Snap acquired Luxury, actually a company founded by my friend with the main office in Odessa okay. that was that created these face filters. Okay, so yeah, if, yeah. if not Luxury, then we wouldn't probably have uh, face filters on Snap. And I think Snap needed Luxury more than Luxury needed Snap because otherwise Sna Snap wouldn't just a primitive app where, you, where your photo gets removed every day, right? Nothing more than that. So, and, uh, so that's why it was like one of the things that inspired me, this lu story, this Luxury company, right? Acquired for 150 million with zero revenue. That's uh, one of the biggest exits I think uh, I know of, of like on the Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah. And so, this is like your, your friend? Yeah, yeah, friend, Victor, yeah, yeah. He, he, the, 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 he was at Snap for a long time and now he lives in Thailand. Okay. So, uh, but, and then, uh, yeah, and I was, uh, that thing uh, also was one of the things that really inspired me. And I started to look in that uh, direction, but I didn't want to do a, another face filter app or the, or the app to put your makeup in AR on your face, something like that. I wanted to prove, I, I want to create some, meaningful use case that brings value, can bring value to many industries via augmented reality or computer vision. So to build something on top of smartphone camera that can be used for businesses and consumers at scale. And that's how we got into, uh, so I had my first co-founder. Yeah, actually, we'll go back to co-founder issues because I went through some e issues in this company. Yeah. But, so I started it with my friend at the time uh, who was running a so basically said, hey, I'm still running my previous company, right. but what if you quit your job and I'll start paying you salary and I started and you will, uh, here's the budget, you just go and hire the best engineers you can find. And what, 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 what was good about Ukraine that we, we had a lot of R&D centers, Samsung, uh, uh, Luxoft, like looks of these are people be, uh, building uh, apps for cars and especially right. with computer vision, et cetera, for Mercedes, for Porsche, et cetera. And like uh, lots of R&D centers, like, and we- You had the right people. We were able to poach them right and we also we poached my f future technical co-founder from intel he's in london you uh, know but yeah so and then uh, and i was like for the first year they were just experimenting it was pure experimentation pure r d yeah i was running my first company but i was spending more and more time with 3d look with new company because i'm like wow that's so exciting that's so cool because yeah, we wanted basically to unlock mobile to democratize mobile body scanning because before uh before 3 3d look Microsoft tried it and failed. Amazon tried it and failed. And then Amazon tried it for, until, until recently and failed, right? Uh, hundreds of startups tried it and failed. Because the idea is obvious. Idea is not genius at all. Like, okay, what if, what if you can scan and measure someone's body using your smartphone to get the right size of clothing, to see your fat percentage, your body composition? Yeah. Right, you're wearing a whoop band right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, like, what if you can do, you can do many things with your body data, with your body, we can call it body profile, whatever, right? Yeah. Idea is on the surface, but execution really, I mean, just not non-trivial at all. And we just, why we, why we succeeded from a technology standpoint at first, because I think we started, first of all, I brought my people from my previous company to run operations, finances, etc. So we, we were able to, uh, kickstart uh, like the operations very quickly. Also recruiting very quickly. Yeah. Recruiting was the critical piece because we had to, we had to find the best uh, engineers, right? And then I was really good, I think, in customer development and kind of early sales to find first design partners. And I've been already spending more time in US than in, in, in the US than in Ukraine, or maybe like equal amount of time. 
Uh, and uh, that's how we got it. We, we, and then I said, okay, what if I, I just want to do it full time? I don't know. Because because I had like every Monday I would do my previous company. Every Tuesday I would do my... my so thing. you had it split up by day? But by day or sometimes not by day, but just half of the day. And I'm like, well, okay. by the time I do that advertising, I, I'm... I'm I'm just counting seconds, really. I want. I'm dreaming about switching to, and I'm like, why am I doing this? Go fuck it. Just and and then I, 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 and I appointed a different CEO there, and I went to build a, just three look, and I had a conflict with my investors in my previous company, but we figured it out. But uh, the idea was that uh, it's not. It's not like I decided to abandon it. There were several, several re reasons why, because the market really started to go. In the, into a decline because because of all that fraud. A lot of big advertisers started to sue their agencies, like Uber uh, sued their agency, uh, big game developers sued their agencies because agencies were allowing a lot of fraudulent traffic to get into their apps, right? And at that time, and also we suffered because we were sitting behind, below agencies, right? And we suffered because big advertisers were completely shutting down that entire channel, more cost per install channel, right? But that's why it was going in a decline. I was like, well, let's just maybe make sure we can sustain it. But I mean, I just want to do at, at the same time. I'm not the guy. I'm not the best guy to run a company during bear market, right? I want to do some, uh, something else. But here is the CEO, right? Okay. And I switched to 3D Look, and then it was super exciting. I mean, I mean, like uh, seven years, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, kind of more, like I'm not very involved in operations now. And uh, yeah, the company was went through a lot of stages because it, super. We worked on something super new and still working it. We went through fast growth VC part of the story, raised 16 million. Uh, then we understood that well, we got early design partners, we got innovators, but we couldn't move further according uh, on, on this kind of uh, demand curve to early majority because it was still very new. How did you manage uh, distribution? Was it mostly through partners? Oh, uh, no, no, directly, directly. Because be, because through partners, we spent, we wasted a lot of time on channel partners, yeah. like Accenture, uh, Delo uh, like Deloitte, BCG, uh, you name it. But the problem is that when I realized that if you still haven't figured out how to sell it yourself, the partners would never figure out right. better than you, right? So we spent, wasted yeah. a lot of time on partners, but in fact, it didn't help us. And then we said, no, we're not, 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 not going to talk to partners. Only recently, only this year, we started to launch first pretty good channel partnerships. Only now, right? Yeah. So, so, and th then, after being on a fast, like, f fast growth VC back trajectory, then we realized that we raised too much money, we were overspending, we had to become much more leaner version of the company because at some point of time I had like 50 engineers or something. I mean, I'm not, when I'm going back, I'm like, why? Now we have in total 20 people and we're doing much better. It's interesting because a lot of times whenever you add yeah. people to yeah. a company, a, a VC-backed company, yeah. it's a little tricky just because you have, um, you're adding a layers of communication, yeah. right? And it's exponentially getting. Hey, podcast listeners, I made Operator Equity as a place for entrepreneurs to invest and buy in other entrepreneur-led businesses. If you guys are interested in uh, learning more and possibly buying a business, or if you're interested in possibly selling your business to other entrepreneurs that have sold their business in the past, please reach out to operatorequity.com. I'm really excited about this new project. And I think that entrepreneurs should be buying more businesses. So if this resonates with you, check it out. Bye. So whenever we're talking about the, the body scan technology piece, there's a lot of different pieces that are pretty big in the United States that are coming to the forefront. So one is the ability to be able to scan uh, your body and do DEXA scans, like mm -hmm. high detailed scans. Yeah. And like you're meeting people in like parking lots and stuff mm -hmm. like that to get scanned in a truck. Yeah, it's yeah. like an awesomely weird uh, customer experience. And then the other one is um, like custom tailoring your supplements and your, um, your diet to mm -hmm. what you need to do. Have you crossed that bridge from like doing the scan to getting into other areas. Yeah, I mean, we started in fashion actually, because I mean, when we were still very active in even like in R&D, like only doing experiments for a year, Yeah, I already been doing customer development. We, I, we, we didn't have anything to show besides just slides, fancy slides, but I'm, right. and I'm in good with slides. So, but I've been, I had three industries to check. First one was like entertainment related, like uh, basically like create a 3D model, dress it, in the oh, funny okay. outfit, right. put it, and at that time it was too early. Now I think it would 
maybe it this could be really successful this use case for TikTok uh, generation. But at that time, it was just mm, people just didn't get it. Then we tried. Then we tested health and fitness, and at that time, it was too early. They perceived it as a as a vitamin, as something nice to have, but not really a painkiller. It actually changed because at that time, AI was not a real thing for, for digital health and fitness. But then we went into fashion, and I was lucky to meet my uh, um, second co-founder, uh, uh, Whitney, who spent 25 years in the fashion industry, and okay. she helped me to basically shape our vision for this industry. And then we felt okay, we felt, we felt pull, pull from the industry. They wanted it, right, really badly. Did you really go the B two B route? Or yeah, of B2C? course. Yeah. Only I've been okay. building on the B two B company, so B two B two C company. We were yeah. we were charging businesses, but we were creating value also for consumers. And you still have your stake in this company; it's still growing. Of You're course, just less involved in the yeah. I'm less involved because I still. I mean, it's, it's eight years since the beginning of the company, and yeah. And I'm like, well, I want to do. I want to devote the major part of my energy of my energy to something different. Right. My invest. My board is fine. I mean, yeah, I have. My leadership team basically is with me since the early days, or almost since the early days, so they can handle operations well. I just I think we need to wait for a few more years to grow for a bit for a few more years until it we really kind of it becomes industry standard because it's still very novel. However, now especially since we got into digital health and fitness, it started to evolve much faster. We started to close deals faster, and uh, that industry actually understands it. Even it needs it much stronger than, than fashion. Yeah. One of the things I want to ask you is about what comes next because we, as like entrepreneurs, usually you think about it as like a linear thing. Like you start a company, you grow the company, and then you sell the company, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's really more of like a cycle. And I think you're experiencing this now, where you're th you're talking about how do you scale what you've learned yeah. through other people? How do you build a venture studio? How do you get involved in different ideas? Yeah, where's your head at? Because yeah. you you have a lot of experience, and you yeah. kind of already have all these different investments in this ecosystem. That's pretty ripe for you to do a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, I try different things, and now you you know what? Uh, that's a very good question because before, uh, like uh, until this point. When I was starting something new, I always had a, in I always had some timeline in mind. Exactly like you said. Okay, in eight years I'm gonna exit it. In five years I'm gonna exit it. Yeah. So I was building for an exit, and now is the first time in my life when I'm like, well, I don't want to be in a rush. I want maybe I'm gonna build something for the rest of my life. Like why why do right. I need to rush? Right. Why do I need to rush? And it's kind of nice that and you build a, a team big, uh, yeah. for a longer period of time. Yeah, but I have a lot of specific knowledge that I obtained in the last 15 years of building and investing, et, et cetera. And I have some very like core team from yeah. my previous businesses to help me with that. So I think I have all the ingredients in place to build a holding company, basically, that is going to, uh, uh, instead of going zero to one again, basically have a shortcut to buy undervalued companies, especially VC backed that are not on VC growth trajectory anymore, and turn them into profitable businesses, and while making uh, sh uh, their shareholders at least somewhat happy, maybe not very happy, but at least okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a goal. I think you have a lot of the like to your point. You have a lot of the Lego building p blocks that you kind of need yeah. to be able to do this. And um, your superpower of, of having sold a business and then having the team of developers mm. that you know and can trust is a big part of the lift. With operator equity, there's a couple of things that I think were kind of important. And one is understanding exactly what type of deals mm. you want to be working with. Yep. Um, not working with deals that are too small, because mm. if they're too small, it takes a lot more lift. And then like running away as far as possible from the CEO role. Mm. like. Um, it's, it's CEO is, is normally like this title that that's very nice whenever you're starting a company. Yeah. And for me, if I'm running multiple different companies, it's hard to have that title and do what you need to do. With oh, of that, course. Totally that, with your title. Because you're also very, very biased. You don't see it from the outside. Yeah. It's good yeah. to be focused for a while, but not, uh, but then it becomes, uh, more like uh, uh, it hurts your your long-term growth. I think it's interesting from like a cash flow standpoint, from you getting to flex like your entrepreneurial muscle as mm. far as like um, your creativity and and you get to see some things that are zero to one and 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 get to see them like hit that scale path. I think that's pretty exciting. Do you have an idea for name? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about Rebel Capital. I think that sounds pretty good because we're gonna definitely change break the rules. I'm gonna do something different. This is like a, a little bit of like a, a plug, but like 
Um, I do think that it's very interesting whenever I see entrepreneurs that continue mm -hmm. this like cycle. Mm -hmm. And because I would personally want to sell to another entrepreneur, I would personally want my business to be sold to someone that has ran a business before mm -hmm. that understands what it's like. Of course. It, because it, it can go much, the deal can be closed much faster because there sure. is uh, some common ground. With a lot of the entrepreneurs that I talk to, many of them sell to like a private equity firm or to a strategic and then they have to go work inside that company for a yeah. while. I think it's kind of fun if you sell to another entrepreneur, it's fun that you get to work side by side with that entrepreneur mm -hmm. during your earnout period. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of something there. If people are rebels and they want to find you, where do they go? LinkedIn and Twitter, oh, obviously. That's it, I'm very open. I'm trying to answer to anyone, at least at, at anyone who writes me direct message. At least I'm trying, I'm doing my, my best. Vadim, I love talking to you. You're doing some fantastic stuff and I think we can probably compare some notes uh, probably in the next upcoming months as, as you build this out. So yeah, thanks I, for being on the phone. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.